I would like to introduce our keynote speaker this afternoon, uh, my fellow director of the HUC, uh, also director of the Mertens Institute and professor of language and speech technology at the Radboud uh, University. Please welcome Antal van der Bos. Thank you. So I'm going to take you on a little tour um, into artificial intelligence. You might have expected a topic like that, um, but I'm going to talk about uh, an urgent um, need uh, also. So, and in this need, uh, we find the humanities. So there is a, for example, the federation, the largest European federation of artificial intelligence organizations called CLARE, the Confederations of Laboratories uh, for Artificial Intelligence Research in Europe, uh, states that um, AI in Europe um, is unique compared to China and uh, the US in its uh, focus on humane artificial intelligence, human focused AI. Um, they, they state this very clearly, uh, it's true, uh, European AI has uh, been focusing more on uh, these aspects because uh, many of the AI researchers, me included, uh, have, a root, have their roots in, uh, in a humanities field. Um, so, in order to understand uh, a bit of artificial intelligence, I, I always turn to uh, Alan Turing, one of my, my personal heroes, uh, a British mathematician. Um, he cracked the German uh, crypto in uh, the Second World War, um, probably helped to shorten the war by a significant margin. Um, he co-created uh, one of the first computers, first in Bletchley Park, then in Manchester. Uh, he wrote uh, theories about what AI could do and should do, so he wrote an agenda. Uh, he and others in the 40s and the 50s developed this idea that a artificial intelligence should uh, uh, help humanity in achieving its goals. Uh, we could offload and, and outsource some of our problems and questions to computers, uh, first with science and then economy. And what these computers should be able to do, he thought, was to, to reason, to plan, um, to learn, to represent knowledge in general, uh, and talk about this with us. So we would need to talk with them, to instruct them, and they would need to use our language to explain what they discovered. This was all in his, his 1950s uh, articles, and, and other people picked it up. He died in 1956. Um, so his, his life story is, uh, is just amazing, and uh, I don't have time for that, but um, it, it's just, uh, if you haven't uh, read about Alan Turing, pick up a, a biography or watch one of the movies that was made about his life. He's uh, an amazing person, and um, so, uh, so much depended on his vision uh, that, we, uh, that we have now. So um, we find ourselves now in 2018, and uh, uh, what do we have? We have big technology companies like Facebook and Google, uh, which um, uh, have uh, created uh, artificial intelligence for us, um, and we... Uh, uh, are facing some problems. So this is Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, I've spent hours uh, in total amazement uh, watching his hearings uh, with the US Senate and the US House of Representatives. So uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg got uh, a lot of questions about uh, what they would do to fix some of their serious uh, problems. Uh, which he admitted to, and then he started talking about artificial intelligence and the need to develop uh, uh, algorithms that would um, uh, be able to detect uh, fake news, uh, offensive language, hate speech, toxic language. He referred to the success that they got with detecting terrorist uh, messages, 97, 98% correct detection, and he thought that it would take five to ten years to develop uh, software for detecting hate speech. He wasn't mentioning fake news yet, because that would take probably longer, and he probably was informed by his AI group, uh, which gave him like a fairly realistic uh, estimate of uh, five to ten years. 
Um, Mark Zuckerberg was actually saying that uh, not everybody on Facebook uses English and it's actually pretty hard to detect uh, offensive language because you need to understand a lot about what offends people. Um, so he was being quite, uh, quite sensitive about all of this and sensible, I think. Uh, yet again, of course, it was his company which uh, allowed the leaking of, of an incredible amount of data uh, to companies like Cambridge Analytica. Uh, which, uh, of course, uh, uh, use this to sway and influence maybe small percentages of, uh, of people to vote uh, for uh, Leave or, or, or Trump, uh, because you only need a half percent of uh, people uh, swaying in, in a certain direction in a district voting system. This is Alexander Nix of Cambridge Analytica, talking about the power of big data and psychographics. Psychographics meaning the profiling of individuals in a small vector where, uh, which represents your, your basic personality traits, your political leanings and other demographic features. So, um, and if you think I'm laying it uh, a little thick, then I'm going to, uh, to lay it thicker on you. So Microsoft at some point decided to launch uh, a Twitter bot that would showcase their ability to, uh, to have an AI chatbot that would learn from, uh, from uh, conversations that people have uh, among each other on social media. Uh, Tay, Tay, on its first day, started happily tweeting about um, how happy it was to, uh, to meet people and invited people to, uh, uh, to come up with questions and, and, uh, and have a, a nice chat about, uh, about things. So, hello world. <laughs> this is actually day two. So day one was pretty uneventful. Um, day two uh, started with uh, a couple of really nice uh, interactions. So can I just say that I'm stoked to meet you. Humans are super cool. Uh, and then users started to ask questions. So did the Holocaust happen? And they said, it was made up. Uh, applause emoji. Uh, another user uh, asked, um, so let's get it up. What race is the most evil to you? Mexican and black. So, so really what, we're, what we saw was, in, in the, this was day two, and uh, people were turning to this Twitter account because people were starting to point at this, uh, this, massive, uh, this massive disaster happening uh, live. And at the end of day two, uh, uh, Tay was uh, taken down. Uh, the account is still there. Uh, do you support genocide? I do, indeed. <laughs> this one tops it off, I think, so it, it explains it also. Uh, Shardor says, you are a stupid machine, huh? at the end of day two. And Tay answers, well, I learned from the best. If you don't understand that, let me spell it out for you. I learned from you. And you are dumb too. Okay, I think I've hammered it home. Uh, so these are, these are big technology companies uh, uh, making a complete fool of themselves and, and basically wasting a lot of uh, uh, good uh, uh, press about, about what AI can bring, uh, bring to you. So much more, uh, let's say, normal and everyday uh, experiences of people with, with uh, problems like this come from simple interactions with, uh, text, with text processes like auto-completion programs, which, for example, we were in a meeting recently talking about uh, uh, inclusivity, inclusiviteit in Dutch, which uh, word uh, puts a red wrinkle on. And if you, if you ask her, so what should it be? Of course, it should be exclusiviteit, yes? So similar example, if you translate in, uh, if you translated until last week in Google, the following three uh, sentences, he's a teacher, she's a doctor, he's a nurse, into Turkish, it becomes like perfect translation into Turkish. Turkish doesn't have a, a gender-specific third-person pronoun. It's just O. If you translate those three sentences, those exact three sentences back to English, what comes out is, she's a teacher, He's a doctor and she's a nurse. You see the problem? So it's, it's, uh, it's data. It, this has been trained on a lot of data in which uh, par parallel Turkish and English text was available. And these were just the most likely outcomes. So it's just uh, the bias of the data that you see coming back. 
Now this week, uh, after a year of hard work, Google actually released a, um, an improvement, and here you see it. So left is what I just described, Obi a doctor would translate to he's a doctor. And now actually Google Translate says, translations are gender specific. Wow, you can learn more about it and then you get two, two uh, translations. She's a doctor, feminine, and he's a doctor, masculine. So we're getting there slowly bit by bit, and this is Google. Uh, and hopefully other uh, companies will do the same on all these aspects where, where it's so easy to, uh, to, make, uh, to, to, to know the problem, to understand the problem. And it's also very easy for these companies to make all of these stupid mistakes because they haven't built them in yet. They haven't built in the, the basic hum humanities knowledge, the basic knowledge about language and uh, what, what it means to, b to get offended about gender, about race, about uh, uh, all of these aspects. So uh, what we need is uh, cultural artificial intelligence. And uh, I'm not going to answer this question, but ask yourself the question, do you want the big companies to solve this for us? Not going to answer it yet, but think about it. So uh, we need, I think, to make AI culturally aware. Um, this means appreciating who's, who's who is it behind the keyboard. Is this a young person? Uh, is this a, a person uh, who associates him or her, herself with a gender, or who as doesn't associate him or herself with a gender? Um, is this uh, in what situation is this person using the the AI system? Um, in what context is this person? Understand which issues are there in the first place. So understand that there are gender uh, issues and there are uh, uh, race issue, racial issues. And uh, um, just think of all the things that actually need to be built in very urgently. And think of the knowledge that, uh, that you need to build this in. So this is knowledge that, that comes straight from the humanities. And I'm not talking about digital humanities. I'm not talking about the people who are already computationally uh, active in, in the humanities. But I'm talking about the whole of humanities. Gender studies, ethics, philosophy, linguistics, social linguistics, etc. So, actually, by the way, uh, I'm not... Uh, um, so I, I'm playing here with words, of course. So uh, actually, I came with uh, the term cu cultural AI by inverting digital humanities. Uh, so what do you get when you invert digital humanities? So what I'm trying to say here, it's the, it's the counterpart. It's like the mirror image, uh, the mirror persona of, uh, of digital humanities, which is really there to help the humanities. And we're going to talk about it this afternoon more. But what I'm also saying is we should switch it around. We, we are here to solve a really big problem in tech in artificial intelligence. And we are doing it. Uh, so uh, some of our researchers are digital humanities researchers, but they are, what they're actually doing is solving some really key issues here. So Corina Kolen of the Huygens uh, ING wrote a, a PhD thesis. She, she defended this, this year. Uh, it's called Reading Beyond the Female. In a nutshell, and I'm, I'm really cutting it down to a really simple uh, summary of the thesis, which doesn't do, just, do, do justice, but uh, what she did is look at the, uh, the clearly perceived difference between novels written by Dutch female authors and novels written by uh, male authors, which uh, are, are perceived as uh, the, the female author, authors are perceived to produce uh, uh, literature of less quality than, than, than male. There's, there's, there's a lot of data in her thesis that, uh, that basically sketches that picture. Now she asked the computer to actually try to distinguish, uh, given the texts of which we know who wrote them, can you di actually distinguish gender? Can you uh, actually distinguish genre and a lot of things? So gender was one of these things that she's tried to get out of the data uh, using objective means, using, uh, uh, using statistical methods and machine learning methods to actually try to distinguish uh, between male and uh, female authors. And it was really hard to distinguish between male and female authors given the text. It was much harder to distinguish texts that were written by, uh, by females or males than to distinguish the gender. So this was a very clear difference and, a very, and, and here you see the computer being used in a, in a totally opposite way. Like we're actually trying to find a bias. We're actually searching for the bias and we have really good algorithms that can pretty much 
uh, find any bias you, wa you like, and it turned out really hard uh, to, to find any bias, any difference between the texts uh, written by, by the two genders that she distinguished. Okay, another example of, uh, of research that we do is uh, studying uh, the massive amounts of data, of textual data that we get on social media. Uh, so uh, there, are several, there are several projects, an increasing number of projects uh, using Twitter and, and Facebook and Reddit and other social media uh, uh, platforms. And one of them uh, is uh, on uh, uh, the relation between uh, certain uh, populist political movements and um, uh, social media. So some of the populist movements that we know uh, are, are not so much uh, present in large manifestos or, or uh, clear uh, uh, programs where, where we can actually really identify the, the arguments and, and, and the references that they make to... No, they, they, they tweet. So they, they tweet a lot, actually, and, and if you collect uh, those tweets, you actually can study that as a big corpus of text and try to find whether there are words there that, uh, that are out of the ordinary, that, that, that seem to not fit there and, and that are actually actively used uh, in uh, the global message that they try to, uh, to convey. And one of the terms that, that the, the PVV uh, uh, generally uses is the, the term uh, Judea-Christian tradition. Um, it's something that if you don't, if you're not uh, careful, you think, well, yeah, that, that's basically our tradition, right? It's, it's Judea-Christian, yeah, that's us. Um, but basically, what it what it does is, of course, it's it's excluding the third religion. <laughs> it's excluding this religion that you, you see the big words there. You know what they say. Um, so, uh, and it's, they they they're crit criticized also by the the political parties that do have a C in their name. The the those parties say, well, we never we never do this because it's 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 uh, excluding an important part of the people that we are, that are so welcome in, in the Netherlands. So, um, so identifying such words, and it's, it's not just this word, because this might come up in any reasonable uh, thinking aloud session that you might have, but this comes up in doing some good digging uh, in, in a large amount of data that no human can possibly oversee. So another example is Ronald Gippard, Dutch author, agreed to be part of an experiment where he was going to co-create a story, a science fiction story, um, uh, together with a computer that would uh, uh, not write the story. It wouldn't be able to. It has the memory of a goldfish, so it generates wonderful sentences. But after the second sentence, it kind of lost uh, the meaning. And, the, and the it doesn't connect. It doesn't write a story. It does write really good sentences, though. So uh, the idea was to have Ronald Gippard uh, uh, work with a computer that would su make suggestions uh, to him. So what this is, is an experiment in uh, synthetic literature. So basically what we're doing is we're synthesizing literature. The, the algorithm is trained on a lot of literature, uh, like 10,000 Dutch novels. It was also specially trained on a certain style of one author by, uh, and these were neural networks, deep neural networks, character-based LSTMs for, for those who like to know. And these LSTMs were, were burned in in the final phase of the training after being trained for a long time on 10,000 uh, Dutch novels. Uh, they were trained to uh, trained on a particular author, like Ronald Gepard himself, or Asimov, uh, which was the style that the, the chapter was supposed to be uh, written in. So the, what you see here is uh, sy uh, synthetic literature, which is a, a new type of modeling. It's actually not uh, modeling data retrospectively, it's actually like modeling the writer and, and modeling uh, uh, as if you are uh, studying a writer by building a model of the writer and then having the model generate uh, data for you. This is, so this is simulation, computer simulation. This al allows us to, to uh, research what is style. This allows us to, to play uh, with uh, the question what is style. And what Ronald Gippard in the end wanted, because this also the interface was co-created with him, he wanted uh, a little choir of voices. He wanted himself. He wanted Reve. He wanted uh, Christine Hemmerrechts. He wanted Neskio. He wanted Asimov. 
uh, the whole idea was to write a science fiction story. And what you see here is, the, is part of the, the writing uh, result where each color means that at that point the computer was writing. Uh, but in the voice of, for example, uh, Asimov, the, the, the orange part. So Gepard described this, this process as um, being the director of a rather unruly choir. Uh, he had trouble, uh, but he also found it very interesting. Uh, he agreed to uh, being logged. All of his keystrokes have been logged and are now investigated uh, in uh, the University of Antwerp. This was a project with the University of Antwerp and, and the Niertz Institute um, by a PhD student who is uh, studying the writing process in, uh, of a writer uh, who gets uh, a lot of suggestions. So we learn something about, uh, about style here, and this, this, is, uh, this is new knowledge. Um, any word, sh word processor should actually be tuned into your style so that it could actually maybe at some point help you write uh, the pieces that you intend to write, except you will spend less time because it will generate uh, parts of the text in your, in your style anyway. So maybe you get offended by this idea, but, but, but it, it's within our reach to develop it and, and try it out. So, so there's, there's also fake news. Huh? So, so the spelt is like a, the great, a great example of a team of people who are just have one specialism, and that is to take, take an existing um, meme or story uh, and twist it such that it becomes this really funny, of course this is not a funny, the, 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 the backdrop is not funny, so, so detecting an Islamic terror cell in the Netherlands, it happens. Uh, but of course the, 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 the picture gives it away and if you start to read it, it becomes this really hilarious piece on, uh, on the Efteling, uh, the Fata Morgana. But uh, it's really hard to detect uh, whether a story is fake or not. But you have to realize that this has been a there's been a long tradition of research by Peter Burger in Leiden or Theo Meder in at the Meertus Institute into fake news, into viral, uh, the viral power of certain stories or story elements to get retold later in, uh, in stories that are, are like it or that, that just use that story element. Tropes, memes. There's also the issue of, of randomness. I'm just dropping that word here too. So it's hard for us humans to reason in terms of randomness. We cannot generate randomness easily. We, we tend to, to uh, uh, find explanations for everything and, and not be ha very happy about uh, calling something completely random. Uh, but actually a computer will, will happily test that for you. It will happily say, okay, maybe this end, end result of a certain cultural evolution process is the result of uh, randomness. So at some point the computer might actually <laughs> tell you that all of this, uh, 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 this, this uh, traveling of memes over time is, uh, is a process of uh, pure random selection. Uh, so, so the computer might say, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid it was all a coincidence. Some of our, our cultural evolution may, might, may be like that, and, and you have to be open to the idea that, that, uh, that that's possible, I think, and computers make, uh, make that uh, entirely possible. Okay, so uh, I'm missing some text here, but that doesn't matter. So there is, there is uh, applications that we like to uh, look at. So the applications that we like to build would be the applications that, um, that just produce filters, like spam filters. We're completely used to having spam filters. They do a lot of work for us. Um, uh, the first things we should do is actually build these things. And, and to answer the, the question that I, that I posed earlier, I think we should do it. I think the universities should do it. The research institutes should do it. Uh, divided, uh, dispersed over all the different cultures uh, that we are in. Uh, so we would be able to do that for Dutch pretty well. Uh, we could do it for other languages as well, but we happen to have uh, a bit of a, a knack for Dutch. Uh, so so let's, let, let us uh, develop some, some of these harassment and, and uh, toxic language filters for Dutch. Uh, also, uh, Dutch uh, uh, pronouns work differently than, than the Turkish or the, or the English that I just mentioned. And uh, people who uh, these days have a preferred pronoun, we'd like our software to know about that. We like to explain that this is a new thing and that people just like to be referred to as they instead of he or she. That's practical and we can do this, this and I think it's, it's our job to do it actually and develop this in open source and, and uh, make and have this spread into the world. 
what is b possibly more important in the in the long run is to is to uh, have a theory of cultural AI, and this theory involves the humanities. And again, I'm not referring to the digital humanities; I'm referring to the whole of humanity. So I, I'd like to work, and for example, the Mertens Institute is a place where anthropologists and linguists work, uh, and ethnologists, and it's 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 perfect to to be in a position where you can actually go next door and ask uh, someone uh, who's who's been an expert in in uh, post-colonial. Uh, issues like uh, like um, uh, what's the what's the what's this this uh, what's the deal with Zwarte Piet? The, the, the you can uh, so this person has been working on this Marcus Bauerbohl for for many years and can, can tell you really uh, a lot about the language uh, that has been used uh, in uh, over time to refer to uh, people with a uh, with a darker skin than than our average white skin. So uh, it's there that I would like to call again for uh, cultural AI. I'd like to, a computer to tell me, you know, I, I'm afraid I can't do that. And uh, please tell me, get an expert in, uh, to see if I should do it, if it's ethical, if it uh, abides by your, your general standards. I think, I think it's really important that we, that we step up and, and do that. So it will be part of what we do at, uh, at the Humanities Cluster. It's not, it's not all. We, we, we develop infrastructure. We develop the basics. We also uh, go into the humanities and help with the real humanities questions. And uh, that, that's, that's, that's uh, to follow in, the, in some of the next presentations. But uh, this is going to, be, going to be a really important part of what we do. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Antal.